the executive director and founder of Just Faith Ministries for his next keynote presentation. So it's, uh, it's quarter to two, and everybody really just wants to take a nap. <laughs> so here are your three options. You can turn to your neighbor and say, could I put my head in your lap? <laughs> and it helps if you know that. <laughs> or you can do what you probably will do, and you will sit at your chair you will look at me with half-closed eyes, and you will do this. <laughs> Which is really not restful, but it is oh so entertaining for me. <laughs> and then the third option actually is a truthful, actually serious option, which is um, if you start to get sleepy, and it's almost like getting possessed, right? It's like the demon's getting in my There's nothing I can do to stop from getting sleepy except stand up. So if you get really sleepy, and you want to remember anything that happens in the next hour, then just stand up, maybe move to the side and lean against the wall, and it actually works. And that's the good thing it works. So, if I see somebody stand up and move to the wall, I know I'll be actually flattered that you would rather do that than this. <laughs> um, I was, uh, it's, you know, oh gosh, it, as a speaker, it's always so hard to hear really good other speakers and then think, oh, I should have said that, or I'll say that, or I have something I want to add to your presentation, or some, or, you know, some variation on the theme. So forgive me for this. I, I just have to riff for a second off of the last uh, set of presenters who were absolutely fabulous, by the way. Could we clap for that again? <laughs> Always, always so grateful. Uh, Susan, Susan Sullivan, and I seem to trek in this, a lot of the same places, and I'm always so graceful, grateful for the grace and the knowledge base and the breadth of references that Susan can draw from. I don't know if she's here now, but she's just such a, I mean, a remarkable leader, a graceful woman, and uh, and passionate about the project. And I, I'm always glad when our our lives intersect at these. Even though our styles, you know, are very different, I flap my arms and yell, and Susan's just, you know, human and real. Um, um, but here's a here's a here's a couple of just thoughts uh, from the last presentation, and that was uh, uh, Pope Frank, Pope Benedict, actually, in his uh, first encyclical, Deus Caritas Est, makes this remarkable. Well, it's not remarkable based upon what we just heard, but it's still a it's a challenging and uh, and if you will, forward-looking. Uh, 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 truth that really paints a picture about where we need to move. And, and the truth is, and Davis Caritas says, he says that the three critical, uh, critical commitments of an authentically Catholic community is, uh, is the celebration of the sacraments, the proclamation of the word, and the doing of so, what he calls social charity. Uh, that gets translated a lot of different ways. We'll call it social mission. And he says, you cannot understand one without the others. Now that has a, a lot of implications, right? And that is, is it possible in our parishes to authentically celebrate Eucharist? Unless, unless we are all engaged in the work of healing this wounded world. And, of course, we can make all the triangles work here. And, of course, can we authentically do this work if we're not fed, right, in the gathering uh, around a table and the breaking of bread and the sharing of a cup and the experience of the, of the, of the risen Christ with mamas? So it's, uh, it just more, sort of reinforce the point. And then the other piece, uh, the little segue I thought I'd use is that I think one of the, piece, one of the powerful pieces of liturgy is it's a, it's a drama of a kind. You know, it's, it's right brain stuff. You know, we sing, and there's art, and there's, there's, uh, there's ritual, there's image, there's gesture. It's not just a talking head. <laughs> Here I am. So, uh, so I thought just to start this afternoon session, I would start with a piece of music uh, that is uh, uh, borrowed from a, a very prayerful uh, uh, man who also happens to be a fabulous musician. It's not far to an 
another heart It's not far to another heart You can hear if you listen hard It's not far It's not far It's not far to another's eyes It's not far to another's eyes You can see through them if you try It's not far It's not far to another heart You just reach out from where you are It's not far It's not far It's not far It's not far It's not far. <laughs> I, I liked it, but I didn't want to hear it a second time. <laughs> well, uh, of course, the, the purpose of the piece of music is to introduce our topic this afternoon, uh, which is about solidarity. How do we uh, inspire and engage our parishes beyond parish boundaries? So, uh, we know where we're going this afternoon. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Susan this morning um, mentioned that she had worked on a brand new, fresh presentation, and um, and what I'm going to try to do this afternoon is my the best tools in my toolbox uh, to help you help others do solidarity. Does that sound like what you were hoping for? In other words, I'm I, I'm. I'm I, the way I understand uh, 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 those of us gathered this afternoon is we are we are pastors, uh, we are uh, deacons, we are parish leaders, we're diocesan staff, and I, I I'm assuming in part that this is part of what you would like to see happen in the places where you minister, and so what I want to do is share one part vision and then practical implications of the vision. Because without a vision, we perish. But without what to do next, uh, we're just thinking um, uh, important thoughts, uh, which is not the whole thing. 
So it's not discipleship. So, so I'm hoping, what I'd like to do is share with you four uh, scriptures uh, from Jesus that I think have everything to do with solidarity. And then pull out, tease out the practical implications of what that means in terms of pastoral planning at the parish level. Does that sound okay? Does that sound okay? And then, and then I'm, I'm thinking too that um, uh, did I see Susan walk in? Oh, there she is. Good. So between Susan and others, uh, if there's something that I say that triggers uh, a question or a thought where we might get resource, and Susan's like this walking encyclopedia of everything good in the world that you can get access to to help you move to the next step. Just, just Susan, you presume just to interrupt me, and anybody else like, I got a good idea, let's, let's do it that way, okay? I think that'll keep us awake. Uh, and then if, and if you fall asleep, then what I'll do is I'll just walk over to you and talk as loud as I can, which I probably will do anyway. So, um, so just about four, um, four, um, uh, scriptures, and I'm, I, I, and just to set myself up here, I want to talk about, in some ways, the big, the big frame that we all assume but really never discuss. I, and not, not because we're bad or because we're stupid or anything. It's just because, in some ways, we take it for granted. So let me just mention this: that my brothers and sisters, the, the Catholic worldview, the, the worldview of, the, of our our tradition, is a very positive worldview. We, we believe that the world is essentially good, and that, and that part of the, that the, the, the reality of that goodness is that God is constantly bombarding it with grace. That, that, and grace, by the way, if I remember my systematics class, is really just God's self-giveaway. Grace is just God's giving God's self to us. So, um, so here we are in this world. If we, it's sort of like uh, AM radio. If you had a radio and turned it on, you'd know there were radio waves in the room, but until you turn it on, you don't notice it. And that's why we pray. One of the reasons we pray is to be attentive to the, the pounding of grace that's happening all around us. Okay? So, and that grace essentially is, is, is God's doing this. It, inviting us into deeper and deeper intimacy and communion with the God who made us. Does that sound right to you? And so life is mostly about responding to the constant bombardment of the gift of grace that is constantly all around us. And, and the, in some ways, the, 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 the human uh, journey, but, but we're going to locate this now in our religious tradition, in the, in the Catholic understanding of this, we're really, in some ways, we're caught between two tugs. And the one tug is this tug of God saying, you know, come here, right? And the invitation is not, it is into a deeper and deeper experience of what it means to be fully human and fully alive, to quote St. Irenaeus, okay? So the path of holiness is how do we become authentically and utterly human and in the process discover joy and the capacity for responding to this grace that God bombards us with. So far, so good? Now, the other tension, of course, is really not evil. It's the familiar and the comfortable. Okay? I mean, we, we really hope tomorrow is a little bit like today. Because we like it that way. Right? We somehow get attached. Especially if today is comfortable, we would like tomorrow to be comfortable, right? And even if God's sort of tugging us away from the comfortable, we, well, we have a hard time I, 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 you know, I do some weird things. Uh, uh, it, it's hard to let go, right? And most of what Jesus, you know, Jesus keeps saying, be not afraid, be not afraid. The opposite of love is not hate, it's fear. What fear of what? Fear of letting go, right? And so, in some ways, the Christian response is, how, did, how do we get drawn into a, a courageous moment where we can say, amen, yes, I'll... I'll do that, right? So I, I just set that, set that up because as, as I go through this, really what I'm, what I'm really interested in, what is the spiritual scaffolding for helping people move into a greater sense of their capacity to embrace the other, which is at the heart of solidarity? Okay? Now, I'll just introduce the topic of solidarity with a story. So you know that I, I, I was in a Catholic worker community for six years and, and helped run a soup kitchen, and um, 
I had a lot of experiences at the soup kitchen, and one day I read a story by somebody else who wrote, worked at a soup kitchen, and it named an experience that I had too. So here's how the story goes. There's these two guys at the soup kitchen. They're serving. One guy is a veteran. He is, he's been there every Tuesday and Thursday for the last nine years. He knows everybody by name. He has a relationship with folks. He's, uh, everybody loves him. And, and he's often, as you would guess, joined by new volunteers. And the new volunteer is a guy who is scared to death. And, and in fact, as he starts to serve soup, he, does, he sort of serves it like this. Right? And it's like, you know, because, you know, if you get too close to a homeless person, you're not exactly sure what might happen. So he's, he's, he's serving soup sort of like at a distance, and he's not, you know, and, and as he's doing this, of course, there's men and women, he's never been there before, there's even kids, and he can't believe it, and he's getting uh, kind of agitated, so finally he calls his friend, the guy who's been there every Tuesday and Thursday for the last 10 years, Frank, come here. So they go back to the back room and says, Frank, how do you know all these people are Catholic? <laughs> and Frank's response to John is, John, we don't do this because they're Catholic. We do this because we're Catholic. Who are our people? Everybody. Catholicos, we're universalists. Everybody is my brother and sister, baby, because we all come from the same God. We are all brothers and sisters, right? That's the absolute cornerstone in some ways of Catholic social teaching. It's, it, in my opinion, it's just my opinion, the most precious jewel of Catholic social teaching is the recognition that we are all so intimately, intrinsically, necessarily linked that we discover who we are in our relationship with each other. Are you with me? You see? And so that's, that's really what I would like to explore today, is how, how do we move in that direction? And I want to start with, um, in some ways, just what I'm hoping I do in the next uh, 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 whatever time I have is uh, uh, two and a half hours, I think. Uh, is, uh, share, share some thoughts with you that I want you, to, if, if you find them helpful, steal them and say you made them up, if you like. Uh, so number one is just some, some little hooks by which to help you communicate. I was re reminded again uh, at, at the last session just how important uh, education is, right? I mean, a lot of people don't know. I mean, I, I thought it was great for our two speakers say, as you know, and I thought, oh, no, sure, I don't know. Uh, as you know, another piece like, I didn't know that. You know, and so it's so helpful in some ways to be educated about our own tradition, to see the things that we might not have seen. So anyway, Feel free to take some of this stuff, and then I have some pastoral tactics that I'm, I would like uh, also to recommend to you. So the first, uh, the first piece, I, just a little bit of sort of foundational uh, theology, which is so primary. You know, you don't have to go to uh, you know the, the letter to Philomena to find it. It's right in the heart of the gospel. You know, and um, and this is a, a text that I use all the time. And every time I use it, there's at least uh, you know half a dozen folks who say I had no idea. And so I'm assuming maybe this will be helpful for you too. But you know, whether it's new to or fresh to you or not, it still helps me build. And so here's the text. And this is a this is a text out of um, I'm going to use two texts from Matthew and two texts from Luke if I if I get through it all. And here's the first text. And Jesus is uh, teaching. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount, and he says this: "You've heard this commandment: uh, you shall love your countrymen, but hate your enemy. But my command to you is to love your enemies and pray for your persecutors." This will prove that you are sons and daughters of your heavenly Father. For God's Son rises on the bad and the good. God reigns on the just and the unjust. So, if you love those who love you, what merit is there in that? Tax collectors do that much. And if you greet your brothers or sisters only, what is so praiseworthy about that? Pagans do that much. In a word, you must be made perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Familiar text. And, and um, there are some interesting things going on in this text. You know, the Gospels come to us originally in Greek. And uh, uh, while not all of us probably have studied Greek, there's probably a Greek word that all of us know. And the Greek word is agape. And that word gets translated into the single English word 
love, and there is a favorite adjective that we like to use in front of that love, and I'll give you some hints. God's love is like the sun that rises on the good and the bad. God's love is like the rain that pours out on the just and the unjust. So the word, the English word that we typically use to describe this love is unconditional. And I think we hear this all the time, and it's comforting, it's warm, and it is inaccurate. A love without conditions. And, and, and here's my observation. The text that I just read you is not about a love without conditions. It's about a love without exceptions. Now, does that matter? Well, let me share this with you and see if it resonates. Um, the story I'm going to share with you about my own family, it's my dad. My dad was born and raised in Natchez, Mississippi in the 1930s, and he's a white man. I'm giving you lots of hints here. <laughs> and you could probably guess that my father, like every other child in Natchez, Mississippi, every other white child in Natchez, Mississippi, was raised with a very strong understanding of who his people were and who his people were not. What the role of white people in the community was and what the roles of black skinned people in the community was. And you could guess, and you would be right, that words that we don't say anymore, or shouldn't, um, were spoken all the time in his home, just as a part of the atmosphere, not only in Natchez, Mississippi, and not only in the South, but quite frankly, it was ubiquitous across this country, right? You could also guess that as my father had children, and uh, especially with his first and most handsome son, <laughs> that in my upbringing, in my father's house, him, my father at 24 years old, that I heard very clearly who my people were and who my people were not. And I heard in my household words that I would never repeat. Now, you also need to know, as part of the story, that my dad was a daily communicant. My dad went to Mass every day. And my dad loved us like a rock. My dad was committed to us and not Less than a hundred thousand times I heard my dad say to you, I love you kids without conditions. And after he would say that to us in the morning and we'd go off to school, then later in the day when we got back, we would hear something about the damn other kind. So here's the question I want to ask you. It's a, it's, a, it's a ticklish question. I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot, but here's the question I could ask you. Was my dad's love for his kids heartfelt? Yes. Oh, yeah. Was my, kids, my, was my dad's love for his kids loyal? Yes. Yeah. Was my dad's love for his kids agape? See, not only was my dad, my dad's love extended to his kids contingent on a certain skin color, presumably, but my dad trained us in a love that was deliberate, not just tolerated exceptions, but was deliberate about creating the exceptions. Are you with me? You see, well, you see when we talk about the, the logic of, of, of solidarity, it is it is a love that gets, gets extended to all without exceptions. So the language of an unconditional love works great. Let's pretend Joe's my son, and I say to Joe, son, I love you unconditionally. I, I will do anything for you, right? Especially if you turn the volume down when the song's too loud. Right? <laughs> I mean, in other words, that, that sense of being committed to my own is one thing, and be committed to all without exceptions 
is a different. They might be, they might be related, but they're not necessarily related. Are you with me? You see? And so, for example, let me just say this by way of being provocative. Remember last night I was supposed to come in and bother everybody, so that's what I'm going to do right now. So when we talk about Catholic family, the heart of Catholic family is not just how much do I love my kids, but how much do I love everybody's kids? Are you with me? You see, that's where solidarity takes us. Okay, now, in the same reading, there's another Greek word called philia, which is translated into the English word love. But this love is different than this one. Now, if you think of the city Philadelphia, that will give you some clues, right? Brotherly love. Philia, in the Greek, is the love of the Smiths for the Smiths, and the love of the Joneses for the Joneses. It's the love of your tribe, of your clan, of your mob, of your motorcycle gang, or whatever it is, your bowling club. But it's, it's defined by a sense of affection for and limits to. Are you with me? And so, and it goes something like this. You've been told to love your countrymen, everybody that salutes this flag, and not others who salute a different flag. Are you with me? You've been told to love people, here's my dad's version, you've been told to love people with this skin color, but not this skin color. You've been told to love people on this side of the border, but not people on that side of the border, especially when they come across the border. I hope I describe something that's familiar to you, right? And there's a, a thousand and one variations of this theme which are the cultural blockage to the God that we worship. In other words, the world's gods are tribal gods. The God who loves my tribe. And the, the odd, strange thing about this God of the Jews and then the God of Jesus Christ is a God who loves us all, right? Embraces the whole enchilada, right? And, and, uh, and, and, we're called to do the same. So, my brothers and sisters, um, just to, I'll use a different color pen here. When we talk about a constitutive dimension of our faith, that word constitutive is not martini party water. Uh, it means, uh, central, not optional, not peripheral. So, for example, a constituted dimension of our faith is the Eucharist, right? Right? Nobody would think, uh, well, I think the Eucharist is kind of optional for us Catholics. <laughs> so it's a central piece. What I want to argue is that a constitutive dimension of authentic discipleship looks like this. And what do I mean by this squiggly line? Well, here's what I mean. I meant that to look like a road, at least in Louisville. <laughs> and, um, and, that, and that little squiggly line is to suggest the spiritual journey. Now, remember the spiritual journey as I, as I painted it when I started? That there is this God doing this. And I think what all of us look toward in our faith and look to the gospel for and look to Jesus for is how do I appropriate the showering of grace in my life and follow the path into a deeper and deeper affection and intimacy and communion with the God who birthed me. Okay? And again, this is an image. I mean, these are, this is just an image, but it's, but it's meant to sort of describe an experience. So, so, what I'm suggesting here is that a necessary part of what it means to follow Jesus is this movement from a love that has restrictive definitions about who I love and who I don't, to a place where I move into some spiritual, not only capacity, not only willingness, but ultimately appetite for it, right? In other words, I can't not do this, right? You, when you, you can encounter someone like Mother Teresa or apparently Dorothy Day, they could not imagine not doing what they were doing. Are you with me? And so how do we become a people, not only who are willing on occasion to say, oh, I should pay attention to somebody who's, you know, but try to become a person on fire about the care for all human beings because my life is in some ways in, inflamed by 
a spirit that will not allow me not to do that. Are you with me? So, so, here's, so, so here's how the path looks. We think, and I'm not, again, there's this God over here that's doing this beckoning, and I say to myself, like I'm guessing you would, of course I want deeper intimacy with that God. Of course I want a deeper communion with that God. And I'm ready to go, but according to the text, right, I want to get started, but I can't, I can't move forward. Unless something happens. I can't embrace this invitation of grace by this God who loves me unless something happens. And the something that has to happen is this puny definition of who I will love and who I won't. Who I choose to spend my time with and who I never would. Who I'm committed to. To whose good I'm committed to and whose good is somebody else's problem. That puny definition somehow has to crack open, soften, and get a little larger. And when that happens, then and only then this happens. I can take a step into a deeper relationship with God. And for me to take yet another step, again, this definition of who's precious, who's not, who's important to me, who's not, who's lovable, who's not, again, has to soften, crack open, get a little bit larger. Our hearts have to be broken, maybe. We take another step. And again, and again, and again, until journeys end, of course, as God, and in, and in the Johannine writings, John says, God is love. love. Which one? Agape. Agape, the love without no. exceptions. Now, here's the point. For me to know communion with that God, I am then made in the image of God, and I'm using this language very deliberately to provoke you a little bit, I must become an incarnate vessel of the same love that is the essential description of who God is. Are you with me? In other words, my movement into a God who loves without exceptions is to step by step become a person who is capable of taking in all of my brothers and sisters without exception. The great Dorothy Day once said, we only love God as much as we love the person whom we love the least. That's prophetic for you, right? And so, and so what I'm suggesting, my brothers and sisters, is that for those of us who are interested in parish ministry, or those of us who are interested in the care and the nurture of people's spiritual lives, we have no choice. Yet the stuff of social mission is not optional, peripheral, extracurricular, or you know, just for the green beret version of, of Catholics. It's, it's for all of us, because otherwise we can't appropriate the invitation that God is pouring down. Are, are you with me? So, so uh, what that means, I think, then, is that part of pastoral strategy in the parish is how do we provide occasions, opportunities for people to connect with the one that they had not connected with before. Okay? Now, you know, the title of this talk about solidarity was meant to sort of beyond parish boundaries. But more and more and more it becomes the case that a lot of this work needs to happen within parish boundaries because as Susan mentioned in her earlier presentation, and as we all know, in many parishes, and I don't know how this diocese has handled this, so I, I just thought, uh, um, I, this thought just comes to mind. But um, I, mean, I know a lot of realities around the country where now there's dual, there's like parallel parishes in the same place. And it's not because people thought this was the best idea it's just because it started off with a Spanish mass on Sunday night, and it evolved from there, and it got bigger and bigger. And essentially, these two communities, both of which claim St. Michael's Catholic Church as their church, actually don't know each other. And so, and so there, is a, there is a work to be done even within, within parishes. But here's the point. As part of pastoral strategy, and I'm going to describe this in more detail in a few minutes, is how do we help people... Um, engage in relationship with the ones who are outside of their little definition of who they thought they would love, should love, could love in their lives. Are you with me? 
I, I had a lovely conversation with, let's see if I have her name written down. I, I do have it written down, I just don't know where. Uh, but we had, a we had a conversation this morning, and she was talking about how, uh, sh uh, sh well, by way of shameless promotion, they used one of our, uh, uh, our uh, curriculum, tool, curriculum tools uh, about prison ministry. And were so kind of taken by it, and then had had a relationship with somebody who happened to be in jail. That was part of the reason they got interested. They were so sh jazzed up, they decided to sort of try on this thing called prison ministry. I think it was ten years or, or well, many years ago now. And um, and now they can't not do what they do. There's a certain passion about uh, prison ministry because because they recognized. And, and this is how it goes so often, right? That they were part of this group. People, and I, you know, I hear this come out of people's mouths, and it saddens me. You know, we must let those people rot in hell. <laughs> if they do something bad, just let them rot there because they deserve to be there. How do you move from that to a place where relationship is so critical, and not only are you interested in their spiritual and physical and psychological and emotional well-being, but you commit lots of time and energy not only for their care, but even for, in some ways, the improvement of, 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 the, of, of, the, of the process that's used to punish them, right? For those who are not involved in prison ministry, it's not, it's a, it's a broken system. It's a very broken system. Uh, and I see the people who are doing prison ministry shaking their heads. So, uh, okay, so, um, so this is part, of, and then there's this great ending text, which sometimes is befuddling to us. It says, you, this is the end of the text that I just read, you must be made perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. What does that mean? First of all, when I first read it, I thought, that's the stupidest thing Jesus ever said. <laughs> Actually, I didn't say it. I mean, meaning, perfect? Are you kidding me? And it turns out, this is not perfect, like perfect without mistake. It means perfect without Exception. We must become a people made in the image of God who, like the God who made us, become a community, a presence in the world that takes in everybody as our brother and sister. That's, that's the meaning and the invitation of solidarity. And that's the, it's at the heart of what it means to be transformed by Christ. Are you with me? Okay. All right. Um, So I'm supposed to end at 20 till. I have 15 minutes. How much time do I really have? <laughs> if you say 10, I'm really going to be suspicious. Take as much time as you need. Yeah, it's 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay. Good. Okay. So, um, so the, the first tidbit is how do parishes become a place that craft deliberate opportunities for people to cross the tracks? to make relationship with the ones that they maybe have not spent time with and, uh, and, and to deliberately form that and encourage that as part of the life of the parish. And I, I imagine, and this is just Jack's imagination, but I imagine a time when parishes will convene, let's say, annual or semi-annual gatherings like this. And let's pretend we're the, the members of St. Albert the Great Parish. Okay, and We've gathered today like we do every Every June 1st, this parish gathers, and why we're gathering here is just to hear testimonies. My brothers and sisters, this is the, the annual Agape Project gathering. And all we want to know is who is loving in a place you had not loved before? Who's loving in a place you have never loved before? And so Frank in the back, Frank raises his hand and says, you know, Father Smith, and of course the pastors, the one who convenes this is Father Smith, you know, I, I just joined this parish a couple years ago, and honestly, I, I never thought twice about going to the soup kitchen, and a bunch of your crazy parishioners dragged me over there, and it changed my life. I had no idea 
the stories of people who are on the streets. I had no idea. And, and, I, and I also want to announce, because this is a good day to do it, that I've decided to start a scholarship program for those who are on the street who are going back to school and you know, whatever. And everybody, at the end of everybody, claps because they're just so excited about what's happened, right? And somebody else talks about how they, you know, Ann, Ann Murphy, she raises her hand and she says, uh, uh, Jack, I just want to let you know that um, I, I started visiting you know that nursing home in town where a lot of poor people are sort of dumped, and um, this one guy, he's got, he's got no family, he's got no money, he was just so bitter, and I just started going there every week just to be with him, just to be present. And she said, I don't know how much good it's done. We've become, we've become pretty close, but she goes, I can tell what it's done to me, and it's opened up my heart. And it's made me realize that there are just lots and lots of people who are lonely and abandoned. And I can't make sense of my faith anymore unless I go there. Every time I hear you proclaim, the, you know, every time I hear the gospel proclaimed on Sundays now, I think of the man that I visit, and I'm just enriched by the substance of that relationship. And everybody claps, you know, and they're delighted because they're excited to be part of a parish where person after person stands up and talks about their journey of faith in places that they were not it's 12 months ago. And you, you have a little snapshot of what I'm thinking of here, okay? And so, so that's a pastoral strategy one. Now, um, because of time and because I, I think there are um, a, a, a practical things I want to get to, I want to share uh, this text with you, which is a quirky version of, um, when, well, just an abbreviated version of a text that you know very well. This is from Luke. I'm going to jump over to Luke uh, 16. And um, this text... Again, I'm just going to abbreviate this on purpose. It goes like this. Once there was a rich man dressed in purple and linen and feasted splendidly every day. And at his gate lay a beggar named Lazarus who was covered with sores. Lazarus longed to eat the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. The dogs even came and licked his sores and eventually the beggar died. He was carried by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man likewise died and was buried, and from the abode of the dead where he was in torment, he raised his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus resting in his bosom. I'm going to stop the text there. So this is a quirky story, the way I read it, because it has a beginning and an ending and no middle. Here's the beginning. There once was a rich man, there once was a poor man. Here's the end. The rich man goes to hell, the poor man goes to heaven. Well, that's a strange story. There's no evidence of any relationship between them at all. There's no evidence that the rich man saw him and refused to give him anything. There's no evidence that rich man ever, ever, even saw Lazarus. And that is the point. He never even sees him. And the warning there is you put yourself in hell when you can't see your neighbor. So let me tell you a story about me that has everything to do with this story. This is my growing up. I grew up in Clearwater, Florida. Here is my house. Oh, by the way, pretty comfortable. Pretty wealthy parents. Here's our house. Here's my school. Here's the tennis courts. And I lived my life in sort of happy contentment if you were in a helicopter and looked down you would see that this was roughly a triangle in the middle of a pretty nice suburb in Clearwater, Florida. Now, through the lens of the gospel, uh, you know, 50 years later, I realized that this is the spiritual Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> it's like the Hotel California. You can check in any time you like, but you can almost never leave. Because once you get into a life of accumulation and self-preoccupation and comfort and security, it is, excuse my French, damn hard to get out. And what Jesus does at almost every opportunity is he walks right in and starts kicking people out. <laughs> because you will lose your soul in here. Right? Let me give you another example that just speaks to the same point. And then I'll tell you why I'm bringing it up. Where are my glasses? Oh, there. So here's the text. This is great. You'll love this. There once was a rich man who had a good harvest. What shall I do? He asked himself. I have no 
place to store all this harvest. I know. I will pull down my grain bins and build bigger ones. And all my grain and my goods will go there. And then I will say to myself, you have blessings, blessings in reserve for years to come. Relax. Eat heartily. Drink well. Enjoy yourself. It sounds like retirement, right? <laughs> well, doesn't it? God, but God, but God said to him, you fool. This very night your life shall be required of you. And to whom will all this piled up wealth of yours go? And that is the way it works with the man who grows rich for himself instead of growing rich in the sight of God. What would it have meant for this man to have grown rich in the sight of God? When he got this great harvest, what would he have done? This is what happens. So the, 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 you know, Luke 1 and 7 text is dedicated to the problems with wealth. Because what wealth tends to do to us is it makes us, well, it, it, it tends to make us more and more self-protective because we have so much to lose. You know, uh, many people have commented on why the poor can seem when you travel to a place like Haiti or to El Salvador, how people are so hospitable, right? When you don't have a lot, it's easier to share. <laughs> Strangely enough, right? What, uh, what was it? Nelson Rockefeller was once asked by somebody, how much is enough? And his answer was? Just a little bit more, which means it never ends, right? And so, my brothers and sisters, why do I bring this up? Because for those of us, and this is the pastoral strategy, for those of us who come from wealthy parishes, there ought to be classes on the care and the spiritual problems that wealth can bring up. When's the last time you had a class at your parish that said the problems with wealth? Usually it's just that we take you out to dinner and have some of that to build the next building, right? <laughs> So it's just, it just a warning because it is, I mean, it is a, prov a, a profoundly difficult problem. And oftentimes, the reason people don't do this is because they're so, so, so scared to leave the triangle, you see. So, and by the way, just to tie a ribbon on that point, my brothers and sisters, uh, the only logic, the only gospel logic given to why some people are wealthy is so that they can be holy distribution centers. In other words, there's no logic in the gospel that because I earned it, it's mine. It's not there. So it just it emphasizes the point that there is no U-Haul behind the hearse. <laughs> and probably even better is, uh, and I can't remember who said this, the only things we take to heaven are the things we gave away. Isn't that great? You see? And it's connected with this sense of solidarity because uh, when we get to the, uh, the Zacchaeus story, and I'll just uh, share that one with you quickly. When we get to the Zacchaeus story, it's the most amazing, uh, remarkable uh, 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 sort of conclusion to this. So here's, here's how the story goes. Entering Jericho, Jesus passed through the city. There was a man there named Zacchaeus, a chief tax collector and a wealthy man. And Zacchaeus was trying to see what Jesus was like, but being small of stature, was unable to do so because of the crowd. So he ran on in front, climbed a sycamore tree, which was along Jesus' route in order to see him. And when Jesus came to the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry down. I mean to stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus quickly descended and welcomed him with delight. And then when this was observed, everybody, everybody began to grumble. He has gone to a sinner's house as a guest. How do they know Zacchaeus is a sinner? Because he's a tax collector. Right? But Zacchaeus stood his ground and said, Lord, I give half of my belongings to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone in the least, I will pay them back four times. First of all, let me just ask this question of those of you who are here. How many of you know anybody in your personal life who actually gave up half their wealth in order to address the needs of the poor and the left behind? I'm sure there's a few. One? Two? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not a... A completely unheard of story, but we would all agree that to respond to Jesus like that would take some guts, right? Uh, but here, listen how the story ends. Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house, for this is what it means 
to be a son of Abraham. This is what it means to be a faithful person. So, my brothers and sisters, what it sounds like is, uh, you know, Zacchaeus, uh, uh, you know, tears his wallet in half, gives half of it away, gets a ticket to paradise. And what I want to suggest, it's a graphic I use a lot, but what I want to suggest, my brothers and sisters, is what we're trying to do in our parishes is provide an opportunity for this to happen. Right? In other words, this is in some ways the path of solidarity. How is it that our hearts get bigger, and as our hearts get bigger, our arms get wider? And the more we practice this life of giving ourselves away, the more we're able to move into other settings that before might have seemed impossible to us. So my first step is, I go to a, I go to a nursing home where somebody who doesn't love them ever come and I'm, I build a relationship. And the next step then is I can actually begin to work with a, a, maybe the, the migrant community that I never thought of. And then the next thing is maybe I start working in the prison. And now you don't have to do everything. The point is, we exercise an open heart and we become step by step more and more open hearted in the hope and in the dream and in the, in the if you will, the, the task of responding to a Holy Spirit grace that is drawing us deeper into this God who loves like this. Right? And so, again, the pastoral strategy is how do we provide people with multiple opportunities uh, to embrace the one they have not seen before. And maybe, I don't, I, I, uh, maybe just to conclude, uh, if I can find where the, oh, no, never mind, I, I know how to do it. Sorry, sit down. <laughs> Another piece of music that uh, speaks to this theme.
depression sure was feeling complicated. Mother Teresa called these kids Christ in disguise. There was nothing that seemed right to try to do for her that night, except to try to tell her with my eyes. Before you get up, we've got one more part of this presentation. We're going to ask um, Debbie Chikine, the Chesters, and Bob and Dominic to come up. We're going to have a panel discussion real quick. These four people are involved in this kind of global solidarity. Um, and you, many of you are familiar with Catholic Relief Services. That's what we're taking the next step toward. So um, Richard, if you can help set up um, four chairs. Um, each of them will take a few minutes to describe where solidarity, especially again, global solidarity, fits into their parishes, maybe it will generate some ideas on your behalf, and you can come back and ask questions of them. You can tell us what's going on in your parishes so that we can share ideas here so when you go back to your respective communities, you have something in your pocket that you can bring out and say, this is how we want to do it in our parish. It's a global solidarity. All right? So without further ado, let me introduce Bobby Dominic from uh, St. John's Cathedral. You've got... Um, David Chikane here from the Tri Parishes up on the ferry, and you've got Max Chester, who everyone knows is a Red Sox fan, but he's also um, <laughs> I don't know if the Red Sox fan today, but no, he's a deacon at the time. And they are all involved in different global solidarity programs. So um, Bobby, are you first? So I was asked to talk about global solidarity. Um, and the definition I was given 
was, and by the way, if you're looking at your agenda and it says St. Al's Haiti Project, that's not what I'm talking about. So if you're expecting that and you really have your heart set on that, then just close your eyes, go to sleep, because that's not what I'm going to talk about. Um, So at St. John's, we have a lot of outreach programs, um, but I tried to focus on some of the ones that we've done that have been global in nature, um, just to give you some ideas of some of the things that we've done. Um, I'm going to go over here so that I don't have to use the little clicker that doesn't seem to be working. Um, one of the things that we've done, I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, the Cali Columbia Missions. I know a lot of the priests are familiar with it. The Diocese of Boise has a long standing relationship with Cali Columbia. Um, we had a parish there, and a lot of our priests were formed there. Um, and our pastor at St. John's Cathedral, right before Father Jerry Funk came last year, was Father Henry Carmona, who grew up in Cali, Colombia, and so he had a long-standing relationship with Cali as well. In that process of being in Cali, he started a school for a very poor neighborhood in Cali called Petacui. And Sister Maria Elena is very familiar with, Sister, raise your hand, Sister Maria Elena, I call her Hermanita. You can also call her that if, if you like. She answers to both. Sister Maria Elena worked in uh, Colombia for 30 years. So we had this long standing relationship with San Marcos School. And um, as part of our relationship, with San Marcos School, we did a lot of fundraising, we did a lot of outreach for San Marcos, we tried to educate the parish about San Marcos and um, what the school is all about, but we also took four different mission trips to Cali, Colombia, and one of the projects that we um, were involved in when we were down there was San Marcos. We always went to visit San Marcos. This is a picture of some of the students at San Marcos School. And if you look way up there in the top, you see the blonde lady that doesn't fit the picture? That's me. Um, the joy in the faces of those students is, I think, what Jack and Sherry have been talking about, what everybody has been talking about all day. That solidarity that you feel is when you feel the love of the people um, that you're reaching out to. And so I just wanted to give you a picture to show um, that San Marcos is a place where we can have that solidarity. This is actually a, an article from the Idaho Catholic Register, thank you Mike Brown, um, from 1982 that talks about the school, San Marcos School, and it shows what a um, long-standing project this has been for the Diocese of Boise as well as um, St. John's Cathedral. This is an article written by our current pastor, Father Jerry Funk, in 1983, when he was still a very young priest. And he talks about the school, and he talks about the, the people in the neighborhood in Petakui that did not have a school. The school was started, and they were going to start with first grade, second grade, kindergarten, um, just really start slow. And they had mothers bringing their children to the priest and saying, please take my child, take my child. The people of the community saw it as a way of helping their children to get out of the extreme poverty that existed in Petakui. And so um, that became a project of St. John's Cathedral and of the Diocese of Boise. And on our mission trips, one of the things we were very gratified to see was that that relationship was mutual. That we love San Marcos, and San Marcos loved us. They knew who we were. This particular sign says, Brothers of Idaho, because of your help, we are better today. It's not in perfect English, but you get the message. Another one was, Welcome Friends from Idaho. Whenever we would go, there would be welcome signs um, that were created by the children of San Marcos School. The joy that we would see on their faces came from this extreme poverty. 
And they knew they were children of God, and we saw them as children of God. This is one of the pictures that we took when we walked the neighborhood of Petakui, just outside the school. So this is the neighborhood that these children come from, but yet the school, this is a sign actually in the school playground, and it says safe zone or refuge zone, zona de refugio. So this is a place of comfort and care that the children of Petakui could come to grow and learn their Catholic faith, but also to be out of that poverty. So how could we help with that? So this is actually a picture of Sister Maria Elena with one of our prisoners on one of the mission trips. One of the things we tried to do was not only help them with building projects, but scholarships, so that kids that maybe couldn't go to school could go to school. Um, we wanted them to be happy and healthy. We, want, we had this relationship with San Marcos, and it continues to this day. One of the other things that we did um, on the 30th anniversary of San Marcos School in 2012 was our school, St. Joseph's School, adopted San Marcos School as their outreach project for that year. And so they did a lot of studying about Cali and Petakui and San Marcos School and some of the history, and they adopted that school. One of the things they learned was that this is the computer center in San Marcos School, was the computer center in San Marcos School. And this is a picture of Father Henry with the very outdated computers, many of which didn't work. Do any of you still have one of these paperweights in your house? <laughs> so that, that was their computers. So that, that whole idea of learning through global connection, through the internet, wasn't really a reality in San Marcos School. So we ended up doing a fundraising project in the parish and in the school, um, and we had some a, another mission trip that took back computers, money to buy computers, and used um, construction workers to rebuild the computer center at San Marcos School. So that was another way that we did outreach with San Marcos. Because of our relationship, we've gotten that love of God back from San Marcos. This happens to be a thank you note that they sent to us. They've sent us Valentine's Day cards. They remember us, and we remember them. And that really is what solidarity is all about. Another one of the projects that we've adopted is the Missionary Brothers of St. Francis de Sales and Mary Immaculate. That's a really long way of saying there's this order in Colombia in Cali, where they just saw a need and they rose up to fill that need. There are many displaced persons in Cali, Colombia. There is very little help for the mentally ill, for the elderly, for those who are dying. Very little, not like what we have here. And if any of you like me have complained about the mental health system in Idaho, there's virtually nothing in Cali, Colombia. So the missionary brothers have formed this order to take care of those people. Their job, they view, is to take care of those people. They have no funding. They didn't even have a place. But by the grace of God, all those things have come. And so we've adopted them as one of our projects. And so each time we go to Cali, we go to visit the missionary brothers to see what they're doing. Um, we visit the residents, we try to give them comfort and care to the extent that we can. We try to make sure that they know that there are people who care about them. Um, this is actually a, one of the pictures where we're talking to one of the residents. I put this picture in here because that chapel on this particular mission trip was just kind of a makeshift chapel. On a subsequent mission trip, we took a lot of construction workers with us and they rebuilt that chapel. So it's looking at what are the needs of that particular place, what is it that they need to be able to fulfill us, and then trying to fulfill those needs. This is another mission trip where we decided that they had too many people and they needed more beds. So we took um, money, we bought beds, and we built the beds for them so that they would have places to sleep. Another project was making sure that they had enough money for food because they had this rudimentary kitchen 
Um, it was very cheap to buy food, but we just wanted to make sure. I think that another thing is to make sure that you're looking for opportunities, and one of our opportunities came to us sort of without planning. We were going to Columbia, and we ran into a sister in the Los Angeles airport. And she was from an order that ran an orphanage for, for girls and a Catholic school in Pasto, which is um, south in Colombia. Um, and we ran into her and she was talking about it and we just decided to go visit and see what the needs were. And we met Sophia. Sophia is one of the faces of Jesus. Sophia was filled with joy. Sophia fell in love with us. We fell in love with Sophia. Um, and we wanted to do something to help. And so one of our parishioners, um, who is on the right, Brooke, met Sophia, loved Sophia, tried to find out what Sophia might need, Sophia and her friends, um, and what they really need, needed at that point in time was shoes and clothes. And so when we got back to Boise, Brooke and her family and some of the other prisoners who went on the mission trip organized a shoe drive and a clothing drive. And it was kind of technical trying to figure out how to get them there, but it was something that really touched our hearts. And we said, this is a need, this is the need we're going to fulfill. This is actually a picture of the universal nature of children. If you send them a gift in a box, they will play in the box. And this is one of the pictures of one of the little girls at the orphanage after the shoes had arrived in these boxes. And we used it as an educational tool for our parish to talk to them about the universal nature of children. Children all over the world love playing in boxes. This is a picture of some of the girls with their new shoes. The one on the left over here, I don't know if you can see it, is Sophia. The joy of Jesus Christ shines through that little child. She was very, very happy to receive those new shoes and to know that her friends from Idaho were thinking about her. So these are pictures of the girls with the signs that they made, Father Henry and friends, God bless. Sophia's in this picture again as well. So we were very delighted to see Sophia again, even if in pictures. I just have a couple more stories to tell you about Colombia. One is about Samaritans of the Street, which is a ministry started by Father Jose um, down in Colombia. And um, I'm sure Sister Maria Elena knows Father Jose. I also wanted to include a picture of this little sister called Sister Magdalena. Sister Magdalena, I don't know how many of you know Father Henry, but he's not much taller than me, so you can judge. Sister Maria Elena up against Father Henry barely comes to his shoulder, but she was a force for the love of God among the people in Cali, Colombia. Um, and her story will be really important in just a second. So this is a picture of some of the streets in Cali. There's about a 16-block area in Cali where the buildings are all abandoned, and people who are displaced have moved into the abandoned buildings. So this is the neighborhood where they live, often without electricity, without running water, without any means of income or food. They live in this area. And we walked that area just so that we could get to know it during the day, because at night it's very, very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. So we walked it during the day, just so that we could get to know it. We met some of the residents. The residents were very happy to see us. One of my most powerful experiences of Eucharist has been going to that neighborhood at night. And the reason it was so powerful is because Father Jose has a whole team of volunteers called Samaritans of the Streets. Um, and what he would do is there's a parish right on the edge of this little area of the city. And he would have a mass. And everybody would go to mass. And we went to mass with hundreds of other people who were really excited about their faith. Really excited about their faith. They were all wearing t-shirts that said, Samaritanos de la calle. And we went to that mass 
And then we were fed by the Eucharist. And as we walked out of Mass, we grabbed these great big bags of bread. We're sent forth, go forth, and we grab our bread, and we walk through those deserted streets. And Sister Magdalena, I think, could see that I was this little girl from Idaho going, what have I gotten myself into? And she hooked my elbow, and she said, you come with me. And she directed me, and we went out to the streets with our big bags of bread, and we offered our bread to the people who were hungry in the streets, who had nothing else to eat but the bread. And Sister Magdalena said, look in their eyes, talk to them, say hello, offer them food. And to me, that was a Eucharist. So a very powerful experience of Eucharist. I'm going to, just to save time, skip through a couple of these. So I wanted to say, okay, so we go on these mission trips, then how do we bring it back to the parish? And after each mission trip, we've had a presentation in the parish where we invited all the parishioners to come and look at the pictures and hear about our experiences. But we also have an annual opportunity to build that solidarity in the, par in the parish through this alternative gift shop. Our social justice committee, Johnny Krakow is here somewhere. Um, she's on the social justice committee. She's right there in blue. Um, the Social Justice Committee every year during Advent hosts the Alternative Gift Shop. And one of their goals is to offer parishioners an opportunity to learn about all of these things that are going on in the world and how we can support all of those things. So they usually have charities and people come in and they essentially give a donation for something that's a need and they get a card and they give that card as a Christmas gift to someone. Rather than buying them something else consumable, they offer that as a gift. So we have an alternative gift shop. They usually have local charities. Um, St. John's Christian Aid Fund, which um, helps the homeless with bus tickets and transportation. Corpus Christi House, Dorothy Day House, all of the different ministries that are here in the Boise Valley that we support. Our Friendship Feast, our food bank. Um, but then they also do beyond local, like Catholic Charities and um, Stanton and Birthright, Salt and Light Radio. And then we always include those global ministries so that we can bring that message back again to the forefront. We always include San Marcos School, the Missionary Brothers Home, and then we have others like Capstone Mission, Food Resource Bank. Um, the Knights of Columbus got really involved in world hunger um, for a couple years and did Food Resource Bank. And then Dominican Overseas Relief, which is based in a, a, was started by a Sacred Heart parishioner. We always include some of those things. Operation Ubenda, which is started by a St. Mark's parishioner. So just to give you an idea, here's what an alternative gift plan would look like. This happens to be one for doers. They basically say, as an education piece, $5 provides a kindergartner with fortified milk for a month's worth of school days. And so it's not only a monetary gift, but an education for the people about exactly what all those needs are. And that's a way of trying to help build solidarity with all of these different programs. So I think I'm going to turn it over to Debbie. Hi, I'm Debbie. I am the Tri-Parish Youth Minister in Cottonwood. I've been there for 13 years, going on 13 years. And we were talking about youth and how do you get youth excited and wanting to go out and to change the world. Well, they do. They want to go out and change the world. So um, in the process of that, one thing that we have done and um, has become very successful in our parish is we do an annual 30-hour fast. And this actually involves the whole parish. And the reason it involves the whole parish is because the, the and this is through Catholic Relief Services, and if you go onto their website and go into Food Fast, what you'll get is you'll get all the information on how to do this. But what we've come down to is we involve the whole parish through the actions of what we're doing. 
the, we have the local body shops, there's three of them. They collect cardboard boxes for us for probably three months. And they get loaded up, I mean, it's, it's crazy, and we load them up. Um, and in that, we take these boxes up to our um, Cuterville, and we have a fast with the kids. And on a wall that we have all of the educational elements of what the country, the country that we are going to be fasting for, we have that on there. And as part of our fast, we go through what the activities are going to be about hunger, they're going to be about um, education, they're going to be about all the pieces of social justice that these kids would normally probably not um, understand. But we do it in a really fun way. Um, then, two weeks prior, we, have, we, call, we tell the parish that we're going to be coming to the masses. We're going to be talking to them. We're going to be telling them about what we're doing. And we end up showing up at the 5 o'clock mass, and two of our kids get up, and they talk about who we're fasting for, who we're, what, what country we're, we are fasting for, kind of what we're doing and what they're learning. And then when they walk out the door, we will have um, the whole group, which is usually about 30, standing there with um, pieces of cardboard that they have made and say, ask me where I'm sleeping tonight. Ask me if I'm hungry. Ask me, you know, why I'm looking a little tired. Um, and what happens is there's a conversation that takes place. A conversation takes be place between the people of the community and the kids. And right there, there's a beautiful element of solidarity um, between them. And what happens is then the money starts coming out of the pockets of the people coming out of the mass for our cause. Um, once we get back, we do projects that we will present in mass the next day when we are actually part of the mass where we will do a skit which portrays um, uh, uh, something to do with, with Jesus and, and the needs uh, that we would have. And we are part of bringing up the gifts, which the gifts that we'll be bringing up are the gifts that we made during our fast, um, which lie in the altar. And then when that's all finished, the KCs have made us, which they were informed too, they will make us a beautiful breakfast and the whole community is invited to rejoice with us and talk to us about what we just did. And then we sell the items that we made, which we make more money um, by doing that. And during this fast, each of the kids are given a card with a picture of someone from the country. And in that, they keep that card with them all day with that picture showing and relating, they actually write a pretend letter to that um, person to talk about what it would be like to, to experience what, the, what, what they are experiencing a small piece of. They know that at the after end of 30 hours they're gonna get to eat, but what is it like to actually stand there and be there for 30 hours, sleeping in a cardboard box, rain, sunshine, whatever, sleeping out there and experiencing that. So that's, that's been a huge piece. What I love about it is that the community has become a huge part of it. They support it, they know we're coming, and it incorporates them into our journey. The story is so important to have them be a part of it. Um, and so we, we do this every year, we love it. From the, the auto dealers who give us the cardboard boxes to the Casey's who make the breakfast to all the people that are part of it. It's just, it's been a community event. Another thing that we have done um, is we have done mission trips. Um, we did a mission trip to, and I'm sorry, I don't have any slideshows. I just thought I was supposed to come up and talk, but we did a mission trip to Africa with uh, 15 people, with Father Camillus in, I think it was 2004, 2005. Um, and again, seeing Christ in the hospitality of those little faces has been such a great thing. We got to work in orphanage for a little while and to be part of the school. But one of our, our greatest um, learning tools has been our trips with Capstones, Capstone to go down to Tijuana. We've done that twice. And it's the kids. The kids are, once they've gotten that taste of what it's like to, uh, to be out there and to work, you know, when you were talking about 
stepping outside your comfort zone. I am actually absolutely the least technology, skill saw, hammer person. I don't know anything about that stuff. And so we're going to go down to Tijuana and we're going to build. And I'm like, uh, no. And, and it was very scary, but I've never, I've never in my life felt so attached and so real in anything I've ever done. It, 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 uh, the realness of who you become after you shed that, uh, that world is just the most remarkable thing. And so recently, our next adventure will be 2016. We will be taking a group of 16, and again, um, 10 of those will be high school youth, to Haiti. Uh, we have it all planned out. Uh, we, Sean Forrest offers mission trips through Haiti 180. Um, we're gonna actually go through a couple um, that have been to Haiti several times from Orfino, Idaho. And we will be working with the missionaries of charity. And what is so amazing about this is we've had, again, the community, the slideshows, the slideshows have been present, and people are knowing what we're doing, and, it's, it's, and, and they're supporting us in our fundraising. Everything, every ounce of money that we will, that'll take us to go has been fundraised <coughs> and supported by the community. Um, they know we're going, and, and they're willing to step with us and watch and, and, and guide us and be part of the whole thing. And I thought it was so interesting the other night when we had a uh, slideshow on what we're going to be doing. One of the people that will be going with us said, well, you're going to probably be doing things like maybe clipping some toenails or changing diapers. And the young people are like, yeah, you know, this, old, this guy that's going with me is like, this older guy is like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And I'm like, I'm like, oh, no. toenails, are you serious? So the kids are like, yay! And I'm like, okay, we're going to do this. And then after the kids left, this guy looked at me and he goes, you know, when you asked me about doing this, I was great with going with capstone. I was fired up because guess what? I know how to hammer, saw, measure, do all that stuff. It's just right up my alley. But he said, when you, when they said diapers, washing people's faces, he goes, ah, it just, but then he looked at me and he goes, you know what? I know I need to go because that's where my challenge is and that's where God's calling me to grow. I know I need to go. It's not going to be comfortable. It's going to be hard. So for him, that's that step that we were just, you were just talking about, John. That's that step forward of saying, you know what? You know what, this is going to be hard and it's going to be a challenge. And, and I may not have the whole parish going with me, but what's really cool is as in Africa, as in Tijuana, what we do when we come back, when we came back from Africa, we literally found a goat and we roasted the goat and we had a goat celebration at the parish. And we stood up there and we talked and, we sh and those kids did. They, they, we all had new, out, we all had um, African outfits made with, with the head things, and we all wore them and showed our parish what it is that we experience. How can you be a part of this? Because you helped us get here. So I think that's the key is so many times we can be in our own little isolated box and say, okay, I'm going to go do this. But it's such an important part to have our parishes be part of that whole journey. And I will tell you, there's no way in the world, no way that we could ever do as, as youth and youth ministry without the support of our parish, without the support of the priest, without the support of the, the people around us that say, you know what, I believe in what you're doing. So there's a piece there. There's a huge piece there that, that I think, even though they're not there, they are. And I think that's what teaches I think that's what that, that helps teach them as well as us because the same with when we did the mission trip to to Tijuana, we we made tacos and we shared everything we did. So I think I think that's where Eucharist is. If that's where we grow. That's where we become together. Um, and so please pray for us for 2016 when we head to Tijuana. I mean to uh, Haiti. It's going to be really exciting, even for the people who are scared. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Debbie. Um, my name is Matt Chester. I am a deacon at uh, St. John's Cathedral. I'm just going to be very brief in my comments about uh, Catholic Relief Services Operation Rice Bowl. This is a program that the CRS does during the Lenten season, and it is to educate the faithful about food security in the world and also solidarity. 
And so, Jack, this resonated the Bermuda Triangle elements because with food, I'm very particular about what I eat. I have many exceptions to food. <laughs> and one of those exceptions is I like my food to be flavorful and those kinds of things. So the one thing I would just ask you and challenge you to do is eat rice and beans five days in a row. <laughs> you want to enter into solidarity with people, do it right in your own kitchen, in your own home. Eat rice and beans five days in a row, right? We always have a different menu and something else that we feel like eating. And even when I eat the rice and beans, I put cheese on it, I put sour cream on it, I put all this other stuff on it. But in reality, the majority of people in this world are eating some sort of staple like that, bread, rice, those kinds of things. So if you want to enter into solidarity with people, do that. 75% uh, of the money collected for Operation Rice Bowl goes international for food security. 25% stays in the diocese. And the 25% that we use here goes primarily to food banks and goes to uh, St. Vincent de Paul, so we, uh, some of the chapters of St. Vincent de Paul. One of the very interesting ones where money was used this past year is in the McCall area. And in McCall, there's an outreach, uh, an interfaith outreach service. McCall is the mountainous area, so it's very rural up there, Jack. And what they do is they do food outreach and they cut firewood and take firewood to the people because the primary means of heating their homes is firewood. So to take somebody food and then let them freeze to death in their house because they don't have any firewood makes no sense. So they tie those two ministries together. And so that was very interesting. So we gave some grant money to that ministry as well. So I believe we are supposed to leave it open for question and answer. So thank you. So Jack talked about how to how to bring solidarity into your your spirituality, your parish life. These folks have talked about how they've actually done that in parish life. So now is an opportunity to talk to Jack or any of the three of them and, and ask your questions about how, how certain things were done, what, what's the practical application, what, what can you do where you are. And again, Mark Henry and I will get you the microphone so you can be heard. So I hate to be a naysayer, but I have the, the tough question. So how, how, do you, how do you keep from the solidarity mission trips from turning into um, uh, uh, what I call it, uh, the charitable tourism, for, for lack of a better word. Hello? <gasps> you know, I, I think when you do a mission trip, there's always that danger. There's always that danger of, of okay, we're going to a foreign country, so let's look at all the sites. Um, and I think building into the mission trip specific things. Here's what we want to see so that we can help build solidarity. Here's what we want to do. And finding out from the people you're visiting, what is it that's going to help them? not coming with preconceived notions of, oh, we're going to do this. And I think that Capstone does that really well, and some of the Haiti projects do that really well. Here's what the needs are. So this is what we're going to do. And on some of our mission trips, the work has been hard. And so people need to know that the work is going to be hard and that you're going to work. And if you're going to tour, you do that at a different time. I totally agree, and I also think that um, every every trip we've gone on, except for our Africa trip, which I would have to say, but with Father Kimolison, he wanted to show us some things about his life in, in Tanzania. Um, all of this has been pretty much scheduled, where it's like like our Haiti trip. We're going to be basically on kind of a compound area where we were we are we will not leave because parents really don't want me taking their kids around areas other than what we're scheduled to do. And that's a promise I make, you know, it's like, this is specifically set for work. It is, it is, we're going to be doing what is needed at this time, and it's not, it, there's a difference between enculturation and, and, and mission, and um, mission is, is definitely enforced on what's going on. 
Um, I can talk pretty loud. Um, I, I guess a couple of things come to mind. One is um, is enduring relationship. So um, I think one of the ways you avoid sort of we've come with candy bars and uh, books to distribute is uh, that the, the commitment uh, implied in a visit uh, speaks to ongoing relationship, um, which means ongoing relationship. And so, um, so a long-term commitment. Uh, number two, um, that the heart of the relationship is not what uh, we, people from a rich country, can bring to you in a poor country. That the relationship is mutual. And that we recognize the gifts in the community where, where we're going as well as the gifts that we bring. And that the conversation, you, you talked, I, you already said this, but I'll just reiterate it, that, that the logic of what we do for each other comes out of a mutual conversation and not what we think you need. Uh, so I think with those uh, kind of cautions, then resuming a long-term relationship and resuming that the conversation is always about what gifts can both of us bring. Um, and I can only speak to this because I worked in a parish as a parish social minister for a few years. We developed a relationship with a parish in Haiti. And so, uh, you know, basically we had a reciprocal re uh, visit. So we would visit them and then they would visit us. And then we would visit them and they would visit us. And then our pastor went there and their pastor came here. And then our music group went there, and their music group came here. And then, and then out of the logic of building relationships so that we knew the names of their children. Uh, then one day the question came, you, you know, we don't have easy access to health care. And we would love to build a clinic. And can we talk about how maybe we could do that together? Uh, that's, that seems to me to be respectful and to honor the long-term possibilities. And then to address both not only immediate needs, but also root causes of some of the problems. Um, so, uh, listening to, to all these wonderful talks and, and the presenters, um, I couldn't help but feel like, like maybe uh, there was an aspect that was missing, um, and, and I think I have a way of articulating it is, um, you know, we can go and we do these mission trips and we can, and we can learn from them as, as, and, and help them as we do it. Um, but for me, um, what I was hoping for, I guess, from this was more of a spirituality of, of, the, of the corporal works of mercy and the social justice. So, um, you know, kind of taking it, reading, reading into, you know, when I was hungry and you gave me food, you know, um, kind of reading more like I was spiritually hungry and you fed me. I, my soul thirsted for God and, and you brought me to him. You know, I was... I was metaphysically naked, and you clothed me, right? Um, and 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 I worry that, uh, that that we can replace the love of our neighbor with love of humanity. Um, and then, uh, so I guess, so where where would you plug in? I guess this this concept of, of and I kind of I guess similar to um, to Deacon's question is like. How do you how do you protect yourself from that um, notion that you know rather than than loving my neighbor literally the person who's super annoying right next door to me um, and loving humanity like you know because we can watch a UNICEF commercial we can watch a world world vision commercial and see the hunger we can see the pain and 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 um, kind of like what you were saying you just want to give to that you want to love them it's the people who I don't want to love literally next to me, you know, how do I work that social mission um, in the parish, I guess. I don't know if I can articulate it that best, but. Um, well, I, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a um, if I understand your question right, um, I think um, what I have heard today um, is, out of the logic of our experience of, of God's presence in our lives, there is a motivation to be about the care of each other. And in um, part of social mission is that, uh, in Jesus, the incarnation speaks to this, that bodies matter, that human life 
is intrinsically valuable and has dignity. And, um, and as we do this work, and I, maybe this is to your question, as we do this work um, about, for example, pro providing housing for those who are naked and providing food for those who are you know, hungry and so forth, um, how is it that we communicate our faith in that? Is that part of the question? Yeah, I guess, you know, because what, what is a greater loss? The loss of a life from hunger or loss of the soul from spiritual starvation? Yeah, and, and I don't know that Jesus answers that question exactly. But here's what I would say is that um, um, for us as a people of God, we're very invested in the well-being of the other. And Catholic social teaching speaks to that intersection and all, four, all, all components of what it means to live a full human life. So to have faith and to have food are both important pieces for us. And so, um, and then the question may be, as we do this work, for example, you maybe have heard this, you know, there are places where we will feed you at the soup kitchen if, if you will, you know, sort of commit yourself to Christ before we do it. And that's not going to go, right? That's a forced, forced hand. Um, so I think um, what we try to be is a place of faith where people pray, where people's lives shine uh, the good. And if someone asks, why do you do what you do, which is really this first question related to evangelization, then I say, I do what I do because uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I care about your life. Something like that. Yes, ma'am. Can I just say this? A movie out right now called Little Boy. Remember, it's just about everything we're talking about right now. And so I think it's not in all theaters right now, but uh, it's an excellent movie about the Beatitudes. It's, it takes place in the 40s, I think, during World War II. Um, and I'm not going to tell you the story, but get it and discuss it maybe in your parishes. I think it's a wonderful. Can you repeat the name of the movie? Little Boy is the name of the movie. Uh, after yes. this comment, we're going to break for uh, uh, about 20 minutes. Voice. About 20 minutes of a break after this comment. I want to expand a little bit on the question that you have. Um, uh, and, and this is specifically with Capstone and, and the approach. The main reason that I started going to Capstone was not because it was easy. It was very hard for me. I'm a very emotional person. I mean, and, and I knew that once I would get involved, it would take a big part of me, so it was not an easy thing to do. And when you're in front of one of these kids, a young adult, and you have to change a diaper, you know, and you have to wipe this kid, that's not an easy task, especially for a man like me that's sitting in front of a computer all day. But, but how do we bring that spirituality? It's not just a faith, a faith without action is, is a dead faith, but at the same time, actions without faith are worth nothing. And uh, when we go there, we do take our faith with that. We don't take our faith hat and we leave it at home. The biggest question that we get asked every morning in our sharing on every morning is, where did you see Jesus yesterday? Okay? And we are in a task of looking to find Jesus in every single thing we do when we're out there on one of those missions. And it's the same with the prison ministry. It's the same with everything else. It's not just about that. Uh, also, the kids, uh, and I'm just speaking of Capstone, but the kids, we encourage a Catholic education, okay? We make sure that they're going to Catholic, most of the kids are going to Catholic school, that they attend Mass. Um, they know that we come from a church. So all that propagates. Uh, we not only take Catholics, all uh, people from other denominations go, so it's not necessarily just a Catholic outreach program, but it is. Christian sharing, and we are sharing all the things that we have, but, and we're going to talk a little bit about that on our talk later, but it's about finding something in common with the people that are out there. Stop looking at the differences and trying to resolve the differences. First find what you have in common and expand on that that you have in common and the differences go out the window very soon. So, uh, but it, it's just doing that. It's just acting out of our faith. Thank you. We have a half hour break. Uh, at 4 o'clock, we'll reconvene.